I think the world has this um, unrealistic idea that if you're living for God and you're a good person and you're doing everything right, that nothing bad should happen to you. What would you do if you weren't afraid? This is a very exciting time in our life. time that is fleeting. And the answer is I would record her and I would document her life. This is the video that we've been trying to sit down and do for a long time. Uh, we're going to tell you our Micah story. So I guess it started in April of 2014. First, I took a pregnancy test and he was home. Do you remember? And it was like faintly positive. So I was like, there's no way. So he went to work and then I like drove to Walmart and was trying to find pregnancy tests and like was literally texting John saying, where are they? And he was trying to explain to me where they were. And so I finally found him and I was like trying to hide like hide them in the buggy and I also picked up um, a couple of poster boards because I'm I think I knew that it was positive because I took like three at home before I went to buy it I took like three cheap ones at home before I went to buy an expensive one and so I kind of knew but so I um, went to the store and I got the pregnancy test it took me forever to find it and I got some poster boards so that I could like make this big like design to say congratulations or whatever and I like snuck it through self checkout and ran out the door and ran home we only lived like three minutes away from Walmart at the time and I took the test and it was like positive positive and I wanted to text him so bad but I didn't and he was working at a different place at this time which was like just a couple of minutes away from our house so he would come home for lunch, and I would sometimes make him lunch. And um, so I was like, okay, I've got like an hour to make him lunch and to get this whole elaborate design set up. So I got the poster boards, and I wrote like, congratulations, Daddy, on one, and I taped the test to it. And I taped the 15 other dollar store tests to it that I had taken. And then on one, was it a boy or a girl? like question mark and then I put like that he would the baby would be coming in January and then um, my mom was actually going to Disney World with my sister and brother-in-law in June and we had thought about going and we, we decided not to go but we were really bummed about it so on the other poster board I put something like good thing we're not going to Disney and so then I ran in I, or I taped those up to our wall I ran in and I started making him quesadillas cheese quesadillas mm -hmm. and um he comes in and i see poster boards that says congratulations daddy yeah i recorded him coming in and seeing it and i was like i remember panning down to blue because he always gets excited when john comes in and i was like are you excited to be a big brother and it was just really cheesy and fun oh but he already knew it i think just mm -hmm. yeah, the faint line it was exciting. Yeah. And so then poor, this poor guy had to go back to work. The day that I found out, I called my insurance and they were trying to tell me that they did not cover pregnancy. And I knew that was crazy. So I went to this place in um, like a couple of towns over just for like a verification or whatever. And I was sitting there. John had taken the day off. And I was sitting there in the doctor's office. Um, all I could do was take a pregnancy test and have them just, you know, basically say, yeah, you're pregnant. I, don't, I didn't know what, I don't know what I expected. But um, I knew I needed to be at a doctor for some reason. That was my thought. I needed, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. And so um, I was sitting in the back and I wouldn't let John come back with me. And I took the test and um, 
I saw that it was positive and then I went back to the room and I just started bawling my eyes out. And I don't know, I guess I was already hormonal. Excited. Yeah, but I just started crying and crying and crying. I could not get myself together. And the doctor comes in and I'd never seen her before. I'd never been in this place before. And she saw me crying and her first words to me were, is this a pregnancy you want to keep? And I was like, like it immediately went from crying to like, seriously? Why would you even say that to me? And so I got the little paper that said, yes, you're pregnant. And she gave me the due date, January 2nd, 2015. And this was April. So I was kind of like, Jeez, 2015, that's forever away. But even though it was only the second day in 2015, it still seemed forever away. That day I took, it was five weeks I think, I took a five week picture. I ended up deleting it because I didn't like it. So I don't have it anymore. That was the only picture we took. That was all until I decided that I should probably tell my mom before I tell everyone else on Mother's Day. I was conflicted because I wanted to tell everyone on Mother's Day, but I wanted my family to know before the world. So you told them on Eli's, Eli's birthday. birthday, and then the day after I told everyone else. But um, the day before Eli's birthday, yeah, I John was off, and I texted my mom and asked her if she wanted to meet for lunch. So we met at a Wendy's and we ate outside that day. But before we went in, I gave her this beautifully wrapped package and she opened it up and I said, I just wanted to give you your Mother's Day present early because you can use it. And she opened it up and it was a bib that said grandma or something, you know, a grandma bib. That's and like four or five she, of them, wasn't it? yeah, she screamed. She freaked out. And we went in and she just couldn't stop talking about it. And she kept saying, I thought you were mad at me because you weren't talking to me. <laughs> and she was mad because John knew before her. Do you remember? Yeah, but... I mean. <laughs> Not really mad. She was just like, you didn't tell me. Then the next day was my nephew Eli's birthday party. And I thought, well, this will be the perfect time to tell my family. Uh, I didn't really know how some of them would take it because... It was just like a weird point, like I was in school, not high school, college, and you know, we didn't, we wanted, we kind of had a plan to own a house for me to be out of school and, you know, just kind of have everything really stable before we decided to have kids, but it was, our plans changed. And I was in school, we didn't own a house or anything, and so I was kind of, not sure how they would take it. I knew they would be happy, but I didn't want them to worry about us, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I didn't want them to worry that anything, that we would have a, any kind of struggle, and I know that that's how my family is, they worry. I wrapped up some aunt bibs, and then I got my dad this picture frame. It was like a poem, like a letter from the baby to him. That night, Eli's birthday party, I let my sister and sister-in-law open up their presents. They opened them up and the first thing my sister did was throw it at me because she thought that it was a joke. She said, stop lying to me. Yeah, and then my sister-in-law, Megan, she kept saying, no, this isn't true. And mom was saying, yeah, it is. And she said, no, it's not true because if it were true, she would have told me talking about my mom because apparently they didn't think she could keep a secret. <laughs> and finally, I gave my dad the present and he opened it and they believed it. But... They were like, I guess, just completely in shock. And my <laughs> nephew claims that I ruined his birthday <laughs> because after that, it was all about the baby. The next day was Mother's Day, and the men did this huge Mother's Day program at the church. And at the end of the program, I knew because I helped arrange it because I was basically the only woman in our church that didn't have kids. So I, it was like the men plus Missy. And really it was like the men made the plans and Missy did the decorating and stuff. And I made up for it the next year. You did, you did go the next year. And I was sick, I was tired. That's one thing that I really remember about my first pregnancy is I was exhausted. I, like I said, I was in school, I was in college and I would come home and just like I couldn't move the rest of the night because I was so tired and so sick and achy. It was very painful. 
And so from the beginning, I kind of knew that there was something not right. And I'm sure John remembers me just being in pain. I couldn't even vacuum because of the pain that I would feel in my lower stomach. But I didn't know that that was like not normal. Well, we looked it up online and it was yeah. saying that it was normal. Cramps and stuff. And, yeah. and to a certain extent it is, but this was like borderline excruciating pain. Um, like if I did anything the rest of the day, I had to sit down. If I vacuumed my little rug, I had to sit down the rest of the day because I was in so much pain. We hadn't told anybody and I remember being at the church decorating for Mother's Day and thinking like, oh dear Lord, I'm going to die. Because <laughs> I was so tired and it hurt. And But anyway. So and then, I was at work and I couldn't help her. Yeah. Oh yeah. The next day was Mother's Day and I knew at the end of the service the men were going to call all of the women up and give them roses and um so they did that and we had this plan that at the very end john would go up like interrupt the rest of the service and go up and grab a rose and say hey there's one more person that needs a rose i said um since the baby can't say it now i'll go ahead and say it for yeah. for it and i said happy mother's day you're going to be a great mother on january 2nd yeah and now Wayne gave her the flower. Yeah, and I was sitting down, and all you could hear was Lily's godmother, Amy, going, What? Because <laughs> we did not tell her beforehand, and I feel really bad about that because we should have. But it's like the church was in shock and excited, and you know, it was just, it was fun. And so then that day, I had gotten a couple of Mother's Day presents from our family, like a little charm to go on my origami out brace or necklace, and a what to expect when you're expecting um, book, and some cards and gift cards and things. And the way I announced on like our social media to the world is I just took a picture and I said I got a present this year too, and I said but my real present is coming in Jan on January in January. And I put like January second because. You're always naive and think they're going to come on their due date. That was fun. And then I went down. We went to visit my grandma that day. And we told her. We told some of our extended family. A little further towards the end of May. We started. Well. I guess during this whole time. We started this campaign to raise money for a playground outside of our church. Um, called Frogland. Um, and that represent, or that stands for Fully Rely on God Frog. We were raising money. It was really important to me to have to get these kids a really nice playground outside. And instead of buying one, my brother-in-law built it with the help of some of the other men in our church. I was out there every single day uh, just sitting and watching. And they would I remember they would always drink Red Bull. And I was like, because I love Red Bull and I couldn't have any. And I would have to go on their Red Bull runs and bring it to them. And... I had bought like this little baby swing to go on it and I remember after um, it was built they almost thought about not putting the baby swing on it and it like crushed me to think that my baby would not have a swing and I started crying and everything but then they ended up putting it on it but then um, we had this big like grand opening my mom and you know the organizers of the grand opening got John and I this present. They got us these frog statues. And um, what was funny is they got them before they found out that we were pregnant. So then they got this little bitty frog to go with it. That was just, I remember that being just a fun, exciting time thinking, you know, this time next year my baby can be playing, can be swinging on this swing set. And that was, it was just very exciting. At this point, we had not seen a doctor besides the first initial um, doctor's visit that I got emotional and then um, mad <laughs> at. And so, I had an appointment scheduled for, I can't remember the exact dates because it's all kind of a blur, but it was like the first week in June. My mom's birthday is the 10th of June, and I remember it was a couple of days before that. And so we went in and I didn't, like I said, I was very naive. I'd never done it before. So my thinking was I would be able to listen to the heartbeat. I didn't think that they would do an ultrasound because I didn't know that they did the dating, the dating ultrasounds. I go in, I still wouldn't let John and my mom, my mom comes to all of my appointments with me. 
Um, I wouldn't let them come back with me. I went in and they did the whole weighing you and telling you, you know, wear your seatbelt, don't smoke, don't drink, don't do this. You know, just the whole spill. And they gave me some magazines and things. And then she comes in and says, well, we're going to go ahead and do an ultrasound to see how far along you are. And, you know, to see how it matches up with where you think you are. And so I texted Mom and John and I said, oh my gosh, we're going to get an ultrasound. And I remember it was so exciting. It was so like, wow, there's really a baby in there and they're really going to go see it. And they were excited. And so on the way to the ultrasound room, I stopped and I got them and they came in and they were all giddy. The doctor, well, it was actually the nurse practitioner that I saw. It wasn't the doctor. She wasn't in there. It was just us and the ultrasound tag. And as soon as she started looking, I saw her, she was squinting and she was, you know, moving the wand around and she, it's like she just couldn't see what she was trying to see. And it took her a while and I can't remember exactly what she said, but I remember her asking me how far along I was. And I should have been almost 11 weeks at this point. Um, and she said, well, she said the baby is measuring six weeks and I can't see a heartbeat yet and so I guess in my naive state I thought well and I even asked her I said well would that push the due date back a little bit so it wouldn't be in the beginning of January and she said well yeah it would and, and this whole time I knew she knew she just she didn't want to say anything she left that up to our nurse practitioner she basically just said she was just very straightforward and she said you know if the dates that you're giving me line up with this ultrasound then this probably is not a viable pregnancy and she's basically just said you know we're gonna give it a couple of days we're gonna I had to come in several days in a row to get my blood drawn to see what my levels were at because they had gotten my levels back and they were lower than what they should have been my immediate thought was well I was right because this whole time Throughout the whole pregnancy, I had told John, I had told my mom, I had, you know, I just said, you know, I don't have a good feeling about it, didn't I? I just, mm -hmm. I always said, I, I think there will either be two heartbeats or no heartbeat. <laughs> and I, I remember in my mind, I kept getting this phrase, it's a scripture, and it says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. It's almost like God was preparing me for this this whole time, like, it, it didn't come as a shock to me. And I, I heard it too, but I didn't want to tell Missy because I didn't want to scare her. Yeah. And um, and so I kept that in for a long time, and I kept thinking, no, God wouldn't do that. You know, this is we're really excited about this baby. There's no way that He would take this baby away from us because I mean, we're always in church. I'm always doing worship. You know, something like this can happen to us. So John was, well, the place that he was working at this point, he was working a wacky shift where it was like really early in the morning until like 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I was on my lunch break and I went over to the doctor's office. And so we knew that though it was just probably not going to be good. But it wasn't confirmed that, you know, we had lost the baby at this point because they there said just that, wasn't enough information. Yeah, they said that she needed to come back like a week later to make sure. Well, I actually had to come back like every single day for like three days just to see if my levels were ri rising or dropping. Mm -hmm. And so John went back to work while we waited to be, uh, to have my, um, I guess, lab order given to me or whatever for the next day. I got in the car and like I was, I had my poker face on the whole time until I got in the car and mom said, are you okay with this? Because she had, she had her poker face on too. My mom just wants to be strong for us in any way she can. And Missy wants to be strong for her mom. And so. everybody. <laughs> I, and so I just remember I sat there and I said, I'm okay. And before she pulled out of that parking lot. I was like hyperventilating crying like <laughs> you know one of those that it's like snot is flying and you're crying and you just can't breathe and she immediately got on the phone and called John and said you need to come back and so he went and asked his boss and his boss let him off and then we met at our church and mom had called like my sister-in-law 
um, our pastor and pastor's wife and Lily's Amy. godmother, Amy, yeah. to come. Pretty much anyone who wasn't working, she called and said, please come. We met at the church and they just prayed and cried. Every single person in the room was bawling and we did this thing where it's like breaking off generational curses and untimely bloodshed and stuff. And then John went up and was playing. Um, well, first, right then, I said, you know what? No matter what, God, through the bad times and good, I will still worship you. Yeah. Because, you know, through all this, I, I really do think it was a, I don't want to say a test, a test, but, you know, God does test people to see how committed they are. And, um, and I think, so. I think the world has this um, unrealistic idea that if you're living for God and you're a good person and you're doing everything right that nothing bad should happen to you and that's just not reality bad things happen to everyone I mean if you read Job you know he was a good servant of God and he went through a test he, he lost everything yeah. but you know he kept pressing through and there's always a reason yeah there's always a reason for everything. So John went up and started playing some worship, and he played the song Killer, which is a song that, from the beginning, when John and I first started talking, it was my favorite song that he sang. He sang it on several different occasions. And I remember being at the altar just crying my eyes out and praying and thinking, he kept saying, um, you know, there, there's a part in the song that says nothing is impossible for you and that song I usually like hold on to and I kept wanting to pay attention to that part of the song and thinking you know God you're gonna make my baby's heart start beating right now right and but that part just kept like going by and I just kept missing it every time but the part that I kept paying attention to where it says you hold my world in your hands and I kept like grasping that part but the part that I wanted to, to hear, where it says nothing is impossible for you, I just kept missing. And so I guess that was his way of saying, I've got your baby in my hands. And at that point, that baby was our world. And um, But leaving the church that day, I did have a lot of hope that the prayers that we prayed would jumpstart the baby's heart and that when we went back my levels would continue to rise. So I went and my levels continued to drop. I had bruises all over my arms from where they were taking blood um, and I remember after every time I went to that doctor I literally had to stop on the side of the road because I could not see because I was like having a mental breakdown, an emotional breakdown and my eyes were just flooded with tears and I, just, I couldn't see so I had to stop. And it was like to the point where I couldn't breathe. I was probably having a panic attack and just didn't realize it every single day that I left. At this point I knew that um, my mom was getting ready to leave on vacation with my sister and brother-in-law like shortly after her birthday which was on the 10th. On the 10th we had an appointment um, and we were actually with mom um, it was in a place that we don't have cell phone service, so I gave them my mom's work number because we were going to be stopping by there that day. And um, I, I told my doctor's office when they had the final results to just call that number. So they call it and mom answered and they wouldn't give her any information. And so I got on the phone and she basically just said, this is not a viable pregnancy. You know, you're going to have to come in so we can take the next steps. I had had what they call, they actually call it a missed abortion, a missed AB, but it's basically a missed miscarriage where it's like your body is not registering, registering that you lost the baby. When they measured the baby, what she should, the baby should have been measuring 10 weeks. It was measuring 6, so that means the baby probably stopped developing around 6 to 7 weeks, and we just had no clue. I still had all the symptoms. Um, I was still very sick, very tired, very achy and crampy. I remember at this the time we were kind of starting to look for a house and so we would go up and you know look around and 
it was literally around the time that I was having my blood drawn, like to to, to confirm that we had lost the baby, and I was still I still felt very pregnant, and so when she said this, it was just like okay. In my mind, I was like, all right, we got to just move on. What's the ne next step? And we drove home, and it was like I had these sunglasses on, and it was like, <laughs> and it was like, okay, I have to find something to be excited about. And it wasn't too long after that that we found this house. And so it's like we dove head first into finding a home. This was June 10th. This was my mom's birthday that we found out for sure that the pregnancy was not viable. I had an appointment like the next day, I think, um, just to kind of decide where to go from there. And I actually saw the doctor that day and she, I guess she could see that I was just emotionally drained and she said, well, let's take one more look just to make sure that we're not, you know, jumping the gun. And she knew, but I guess just for my peace of mind, we did another ultrasound and for sure there was nothing there was no heartbeat the baby was measuring very tiny the only option she really gave me was to have a DNC which is a procedure surgery that just cleans everything out I basically just asked her you know what do I have any other options other than just immediately going for the surgery and she said well there is a medicine that you can take that will kind of kickstart things. It's actually the medicine that they give you when they induce you to make your uterus contract. And so basically taking this medicine, I chose to do the medicine. That night I went home, we took it right before bed and um, it basically puts your body into labor mode. It Your uterus contracts just like it would if you were going to have a baby. And it was it woke me up at probably around 12 o'clock that night and John had to be up at around 4 so I tried my best not to wake him up but um, I was in a lot of pain there was a lot of blood and I remember just thinking if I can get in the shower I will feel so much better so I got in the shower and I was so weak from I guess from the pain um, that I sat down on the floor of the shower. We didn't have a bathtub. We just had a walk-in shower. And I literally could not get myself back up. I had to yell for John to come and get me back up. And he came in, and you had to clean up the whole bathroom, I remember. Mm -hmm. And he had to basically pick me up out of the shower. And I got back in bed, and then... It scared me. It was bad. It was very scary. Um... You did that two nights ago. I had to do it the next night also. I still was not feeling very well. My mom went, left on vacation, and this was what was hard for her because she was torn. She didn't want to let my sister and them down, but she also didn't want to leave me. But I told her, I said, it's fine. I'm choosing to do this at home, so, you know, I'm not going to have the surgery or anything. And it'll be over by the time you leave. And so... She left. I went back to the doctor. I was by myself that time that I went back to the doctor. One of the very few times that I've been by myself. And my doctor was out of town on vacation. So um, the nurse practitioner ordered another ultrasound to make sure that everything was finished. And um, it, I wasn't. It, it hadn't, I hadn't completely miscarried yet. So they gave me the option to either up the dose of medicine and do it for several more nights or just get do the, go ahead and do the DNC. And physically, I don't think that I could have gone through any more with that medicine because it was just so painful. painful. It was worse than giving birth. Um, but so I chose to do the DNC and... They gave me the option to either go into the emergency room that day and say that I was bleeding and I was pregnant and they would have the doctor on call come and do it. Or I could wait a couple of days, go meet the doctor and schedule it from there. So I chose the second option because I just, I didn't want to do things rushed. I wanted it to just be a good, safe, slow process. And so we met the doctor, got everything lined up. A couple of days later, I went in for surgery early, early in the morning. And they hooked me up to the IV because they have to give you fluids. And 
the one thing that I remember from that surgery is that I had to use the bathroom constantly. They were just pouring fluids into me. And um, I went into surgery feeling really awful physically, emotionally, mentally. I just felt drained. And I was back on the... I'm a very modest person. And I, I was back on the the operating table and they were you know if you if you've ever had surgeries you know that they just kind of jerk on your clothes and this and that and I remember just being so numb that it was just like I didn't care and um and that's not her no like, she's very 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 nice. I do remember getting very mad though because one person was talking about my age like I was too young to be in this position too young to be pregnant and I looked at him and I said I'm 20 years old and I'm married and then I was out I was asleep <laughs> Um, and I woke up from that in recovery, having to use the bathroom again. I had to use a bedpan like three times in recovery. And then as soon as I got back to my room and everyone was there, I had to get straight up and walk to the bathroom. But I remember just feeling a sense of peace and a sense of relief when I got out of surgery. It was like, okay, it's finished. I can move on now. And it was just, it was a very good feeling. I wasn't in any pain. I went in to surgery in pain. When I came out, I was in no pain. Um, but we didn't tell my mom that I was having surgery because I didn't want her to worry. John was actually the one that had to tell her, and she was very upset. But um, I just, I, I still think that that was the best decision. After this, it was... My mom and I are together all the time, you guys see, but other than that, I see the rest of my family several times a week, but it's not like an all-day, everyday thing. Um, it was the weekend at this point. I think I had my surgery on a Friday, so John was going to be off for a couple of days with me. And I remember the next day after my surgery, we went to some yard sales just to get out of the house, and then that night, we came and looked at this house, and then we got the... And she actually loved it. I love it. I loved it. Yeah. And I, it was ugly at the time, but I loved it. I could feel that it was homey. It felt like home. Um, but after that, I think when you have something like this happen, and you have nothing left, like when you lose a pregnancy so early that you don't have, you don't bury the child, you don't have anything to hold you just want something tangible so that day we went out and we bought some things to make just a little tiny garden outside of our church like a memorial garden and I didn't know why I wanted to do that but John kind of explained it to me he said you know when you lose somebody that you love you have a grave as you know you can go to the cemetery and and you know feel like you're still giving them something feel like you're still keeping their memory alive, but in our situation, we didn't have anything like that. We were, we left the hospital just us. So we made this little, just a tiny little memorial rose garden. We decided to name the baby Micah. God gives you visions, and then and I had a vision or a dream at one point of my uncle who passed away holding this little boy that I knew that was Micah, and so... I have no doubt that Michael was a boy. But so we did the memorial garden. We went and bought this little piece. We love willow tree. And so we bought this to go with our family. Um, willow tree statue. Through the year, or I guess, yeah, it's been a year. Over a year that this has happened, I've accumulated a lot of things. Because like I said, you just, you want something tangible.